Hello, this is Mr. Barr from Dunlap Elementary here in Seattle Public Schools. Welcome to our first lesson of the week for fifth grade reading. We are starting Unit 8, Week 1 on determining important ideas and summarizing. Our first thing we're going to do is introduce a new skill, and it's all about supporting your opinions. Opinions are everywhere. We know that they are not facts because they're more like your view or judgment. You can't prove an opinion always, and some people might agree with you, and other people might not. So why do we need to support our opinions? Here's an example. Let's say you want a brand new fancy cell phone, and you ask your mom if you can have one. You might say, mom, in my opinion, I need a new phone. If she says why, and you can't give her good reasons, she's going to say no, and you're not getting that new cell phone. We need to support our opinions because that's how we get people to agree with our opinions. It also helps us to show that we've thought our opinions through and have a lot of knowledge on the subject. I know as a fifth grader, we might be thinking about cell phones, but when you grow up to be a doctor, you'll need to support your opinions about what is best for your patients. When you grow up to be a lawyer, you need to support your opinions to get a judge to agree with you. And when you grow up to be a business person, you need to support your opinions so that people will agree with you and decide to do what's best for your company. We're gonna practice supporting our opinions now. Here's how it's gonna work. You're gonna give any opinion you want, and then you're gonna use the prompt, the reason I think that is, and you're gonna give reasons for your opinion. I'll go first. Hmm. In my opinion, broccoli is the best food in the world. The reason I think that is broccoli it's very healthy for you and has lots of nutritional value. It tastes great, and you can cook it in lots of different ways. You don't have to agree with me, but you need to support your own opinion now. Turn to a partner and support an opinion. As fifth graders, I know you've been working on making inferences this year. I want you to keep working on making those inferences as we read this week. The book we're going to be reading is called A River Ran Wild by Lynn Cherry. The book is a nonfiction book about the Nashua River in Massachusetts. It traces the history of this river and the river valley for thousands of years up until the present day. Before we start reading, let's look at some geography. The pin here shows where we live in Seattle, Washington, and our story takes place on the other side of the country in an area called New England. This map shows that about 500 years ago, this area was divided up amongst Native American tribes. But this map shows how today it consists of states like Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Now the entire time we're reading, I want you to be thinking about the question, how did the river change over time and why did it change? Long ago, a river ran wild through a land of towering forests Bears, moose, and herds of deer, hawks and owls, all made their homes in the peaceful river valley. Geese paused on their long migration and rested on its banks. Beavers, turtles, and schools of fish swam in its clear waters. One day, a group of native people 
searching for a place to settle, came upon the river valley. From atop the highest mountain, known today as Mount Wachaset, they saw the river nestled in its valley, a silver sliver in the sun. They came down from the mountain, and at the river's edge they knelt to quench their thirst with its clear water. Pebbles shone up from the bottom. Let us settle by this river, said the chief of the native people. He named the river Nashaway, river with the pebbled bottom. By the Nashaway, Chief Wewa's people built a village. They gathered cattails from the riverbanks to thatch their dwellings. And cattails are tall plants with long fuzzy ends, sort of like the cat's tails. And thatch their dwellings means they built their homes using thin sticks for walls and roofs. They gathered cattails from the riverbanks to thatch their dwellings. In the forest, they set fires to clear brush from the forest floor. In these clearings, they planted corn and squash for eating. They made arrows for hunting and canoes for river trap. When the Indians hunted in the forest or caught salmon in the river, they killed only what they needed for themselves for food and clothing. They asked all the forest creatures that they killed to please forgive them. The Nashua people saw a rhythm in their lives and in the seasons. The river, land, and forest provided all they needed. Turn to a partner, and remember your partner can be a friend or family member that's right next to you, it can be a pet or a stuffed animal, or it can be a friend you're calling on your imaginary phone. But go ahead and turn to your partner and tell them what have you learned about the river valley and the part of the story we just read. If you have this sheet from the Seattle Public Schools Learning Packet, use it now to write down what you learned about the river valley in this part of the story. You might have said that the Native Americans decided to settle by the Nashaway River and that they planted crops and they used animals, but only what they needed to survive. The Nashua had lived for generations by the clear, clean, flowing river when one day a pale-skinned trader came with a boatload full of treasures. He brought shiny metal knives, colored beads, and cooking kettles, mirrors, tools, and bolts of bright cloth. His wares seemed like magic. The Nashua welcomed him, traded furs, and soon a trading post was built. And a trading post is a store in the wilderness where people trade food and supplies. The Nashua welcomed him, traded furs, and soon a trading post was built. In the many years that followed, the settlers' village and the others like it grew, and the Nashua became the Nashua. The settlers worked together to clear land by cutting down the forests, which they thought were full of danger, wilderness that they would conquer. And wilderness means a wild area with few people living there. Wilderness that they would conquer. They hunted wolves and beaver, killing much more than they needed. Extra pelts, and pelts are animal skins? Extra pelts were sent to England in return for goods and money. The settlers built sawmills, and sawmills are buildings where machines cut logs into lumber. The settlers built sawmills along the river, which the Nashua's current powered, and a current is just flowing water. They built dams, and dams are walls to hold back water and keep it from flowing. They built dams to make the mill ponds that were used to store the water. They cut down the towering forest and floated tree trunks down the river. 
the logs were cut up into lumber, which was used for building houses. The settlers built fences for their pastures, plowed the fields, and planted crops. They called the land their own and told the Indians not to trespass. And trespass means to go onto another person's property without their permission. They told the Indians not to trespass. Hunting land disappeared as the settlers cleared the forest. Indian fishing rights vanished as the settlers claimed the river. The Indians' ways were disrupted, and they began to fight the settlers. The wars raged for many years, but the Indians' bows and arrows were no match against gunpowder, and so the settlers' rifles drove the Indians from the land. Through a hundred years of fighting, the Nashua was a healthy river, sometimes dammed for grist and sawmills. And we talked about sawmills before, those were the buildings where they used machines to cut logs into lumber. And here, grist mills are buildings where machines grind grain, such as corn or wheat. Sometimes the river was dammed for grist and sawmills, but still flowing wild and free. Muskrats, fish, and turtles still swam from bank to bank. Deer still came to drink from the river, and owls, raccoons, and beaver fed there. Turn to your partner again and tell them, what have you just learned about the river valley in the part of the story we just read? If you have this sheet from the Seattle Public Schools learning packet, please write in stop two. What did you learn from the part of the story that we just heard? You might have said that white traders started moving into the Nashua River area and then settlers followed them. You may also have said that those settlers started fighting with the Native Americans because they had taken over their land and since they had superior weapons, they drove them away from the Nashua River. At the start of the new century, an industrial revolution. And the industrial revolution was a period of change in which machines were used more and more to do the work previously done by hand. At the start of the new century, an industrial revolution came to the Nashua's banks and waters. Many new machines were invented. Some spun thread from wool and cotton. Others wove the thread into cloth. Some machines turned wood to pulp, and pulp is a mixture of ground up wood, water, and other matter used to make paper. Some machines turned wood to pulp, and others made the pulp into paper. Leftover pulp and dye, and dye is a substance used to color cloth or paper. Leftover pulp and dye and fiber was dumped into the Nashua River whose swiftly flowing current washed away the waste. These were times of much excitement, times of progress and invention. Factories along the Nashua River made new things of new materials. Telephones and radios and other things were made of plastics. Chemicals and plastic waste were also dumped into the river. Soon the Nashua's fish and wildlife grew sick from this pollution. And pollution is harmful materials that damage air, water, and soil. Nashua's fish and wildlife grew sick from this pollution. The paper mills continued to pollute the Nashua's waters. Every day for many decades, pulp was dumped into the Nashua, and as the pulp clogged up the river, it began to run more slowly. As the pulp decomposed, 
and decomposed means rotted or decayed. As the pulp decomposed, bad smells welled up from the river. People who lived near the river smelled its stench and stayed far from it. Each day, as the mills dyed paper red, green, blue, and yellow, the Nashua ran whatever color the paper was dyed. Soon, no fish lived in the river. No birds stopped on their migration. No one could see pebbles shining up through murky water. The Nashua was dark and dirty. The Nashua was slowly dying. Go ahead and turn to your partner. Tell them, what did you just learn about the river valley in the part of the story we just read? Remember, if you have this sheet, go ahead and write your response in stop three. You might have said that factories are now being built by the Nashua River, and that all of the dye and pulp from these factories are being dumped into the river. This is making the river smell terrible. It's killing all the fish inside, and it's making for lots of pollution. One night, Oweana, a descendant of Wiwa, and descendant means child, grandchild, or great-grandchild of someone. A descendant of Wiwa, who still lived by the Nashua, had a dream so vivid that he awoke in wide-eyed wonder. In his dream, Chief Wiwa's spirit returned to the river and saw it as it was now, still and deadly. Chief Wiwa mourned for the Nashua. But where his tears fell upon the dirty waters, the waters were cleansed until the river once again flowed freely. The next morning, Oeana went to speak to his friend Marion. When he told her of his dream, she said, I had this dream also. River with the pebbled bottom is the name Wiwa gave it. But today no pebbles shine up through the Nashua's river's waters. Together, they decided something must be done. Marion traveled to each town along the Nashua. She spoke of the river's history and of her vision to restore it. No longer do we have a river. It's a stinking, smelly sewer. But it wasn't always this way. People listened and imagined a sparkling river full of fish. They imagined pebbles shining up through clear waters. They signed petitions, and petitions are documents signed by many people that request government officials to take action or to change a policy. They signed petitions and sent letters. They protested to politicians and showed them jars of dirty water. They convinced the paper mills to build a plant to process the waste. And process the waste just means to make their garbage less harmful. They persuaded the factories to stop dumping. Finally, new laws were passed and the factories stopped polluting. One last time, turn to your partner and tell them what did you just learn about the river valley in the part of the story you just read. If you have this sheet, Go ahead and start writing in stop four. You might have said that the descendants of Chief Wiwa all had a dream and decided it was time to stop the pollution in the Nashua River. They visited towns and got petitions signed so that the government would pass laws to end the pollution. Slowly, slowly, the Nashua's current began to clean its water. Year by year, the river carried away the dyes and fiber to the ocean. Marion and Oeana thanked the people who had helped to clean the Nashua. Through the meadows, towns, and cities, 
the Nashua once again flows freely. Paper pulp no longer clogs it. Chemicals no longer foul it. And foul it just means to make it dirty. Chemicals no longer foul it. Now we walk along its banks and row upon its fragrant waters. We can set our boats upon it and with its current drift downstream. Once again, the river runs wild through a towering forest greenway. And the greenway is a path lined with trees. Through a towering forest greenway. Red-tailed hawks and barred owls live here. Geese pause from their long migration and rest on the riverbanks. Deer come to drink from the river's waters. We, too, have settled by this river. Pebbles shine up through clear water. Nashua is what we call it, river with the pebbled bottom. Now we're going to discuss the story. I'm going to ask some questions and give a nice long pause after each question I ask. I want you to answer the question with an opinion or an inference you made, and then use our prompt, the reason I think that is, and give some reasons to support your opinion or your answer. What was the way of life of the Native Americans who settled along the river, and how did it change? You might have said that the Native Americans got everything they needed from the river and the forest, but that all changed when the white settlers came because they took away their right to fish and hunt. The reason I think that is, the text says the Indians' ways were disrupted and they began to fight the settlers. What effect did machines and factories have on the Nashua River during the Industrial Revolution? You might have said that the machines turned the river into a dirty, smelly, polluted river. And the reason I think that is, it says the Nashua was dark and dirty. The Nashua was slowly dying. How did the river get clean again? You might have said that the descendants of Chief Weowa took action and signed petitions and wrote letters so the government made it illegal to pollute. The reason I think this is because the text says they protested to politicians and showed them jars of dirty water. Now it's time for your independent daily reading. Find a fiction book or a narrative nonfiction book and make sure you read for at least 30 minutes. On your IDR slide today, there are going to be some thinking about my reading questions. These are questions that good readers ask themselves all the time to make sure they understand what it is they're reading. I want you to ask these, yourself these questions while you're reading today. And if you don't know the answer, use one of the fix up strategies on the IDR slide. The book I'll be reading is called Baseball in April by Gary Soto. This is a collection of short stories about a Mexican-American boy growing up in California. All right, let's get reading. See you next time. If you're running out of books at home, here's a way you can get some using the Seattle Public Schools website.